and welcome to the uh, Power Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is Robert Red. I'm Chris Heineken. Hey, Chris, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. Let's get on into this, baby. Well, uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, and uh, we're going to be on this podcast. Uh, we're going to start by discussing Battleground. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on Battleground. What do you think of the show overall? And then go from what were some memorable moments of Battleground that stuck out. Uh, via either a match or just a segment on the show. So I'm going to let you just go ahead and give your thoughts. Overall, Battleground was pretty, pretty good. Um, match of the night and possible match of the year candidate would have to be Usos versus Wide Family, two out of three falls. Granted, it was throwback to the days of old, but that match delivered and then some. And overall, the pay-per-view was really, really good. Um, I really didn't see any, any bad kinks or bad moments throughout the whole entire night. So, to be honest, I mean, I thought everything was pretty good. Um, sucks about that injury to Swagger, though. Man. Yeah. Well, really, I'm a, I guess I'm of the opposite opinion. I, w- I watched it live uh, on Sunday on the WWE Network. And the, you that have the WWE Network, uh, Irk, I'm sure you enjoyed the pay-per-view. If you don't have it, order it. To me... It was just a filler show. There was nothing really special that stood out. I mean, the Usos and the White Shadow of Three Falls match really, I think, is what stands out. Really, what was surprising to me was the Chris Jericho Bray White match and Jericho going over because Jericho, oh, when he always uh, comes back, he is usually coming back to put over a guy. Like if you go back to WrestleMania, I believe it was twenty nine in the match with Fandango, he put Fandango over. And Jericho at this stage of his career is just not for doing that. So I found it kind of shocking that he put over or he beat Bray Wyatt. But we can expect this feud to continue uh, to go on. And I expect to have another match on SummerSlam. So do you have any other moments well, or I mean, anything Jack, you want to I'm, talk I'm about gra- for I mean, Battleground? That, I mean, granted, that match was pretty, pretty good. Um, the fact that Bray Wyatt was able to adapt him, were, was able to pull out some brand new moves. I mean, to me, that really, really caught my attention. But I, I was really, really impressed with the WWE World Championship match, that Fatal 4-Way. And for the fact that everything was really, really action-packed, you know, whether it's something special or not, you know, if you got the fans chanting, this is awesome, and they're enjoying it in the arenas compared to us enjoying it at home, then, I mean, that, to me, that portrays, you know, that, this has been pretty good, and, I mean, there really has not been a, a bad match. I mean, it really hasn't. Yeah. And, I mean, I wasn't surprised to see Cena keep the title, especially with all the hype and the rumor or is that you saw online, which I really won't discuss here. But, I mean, I was it, it, I was expecting Cena to win. There wasn't really any other standout moments for me for Battleground. Other than I did enjoy what they did with the Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins kind of brawling. And really, I liked it. The second segment that they had with them, with Rollins walking out with security and he gets to the parking lot. And then he just kind of turns around, stands there, and has Ambrose attack him. So that was probably one of my favorite uh, segments of uh, Battleground, other than probably this a lot match that people were talking about. But, and they're going to still talk about that for years. Yeah. Especially if it's two out of three falls. Because normally, in, throw, in in the throwback of the days of old, you really don't have that dynamic. You really don't have that very, very special moment. But when you put those four talented guys in the ring, and you really, really say, hey, here's the ball, whether you're open or whether you're main event, here's the ball, let's see if you can roll with it. To me, they rolled with it. And... The fans were really glued on the edge of their seats, and so was I. I I really enjoyed it. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll, we'll be back after this. Are you looking to grow your business? If you are, well, then you're in luck. We here at Jonesboro Wrestling are looking for sponsors for our weekly podcast, The Power of Pro Wrestling. If you are interested in sponsoring this, you can tweet me at Robert Red Jr., or you can contact me via email at jonesportwrestling at gmail.com. Once again, you can contact me at jonesportwrestling at gmail.com. And we're back with the Power of Pro Wrestling podcast. I'm still joined uh, by my friend, uh, Mr. 
Chris. Uh, so, are you, you still doing good? Oh, yeah. Let's keep it rolling, man. Okay. Well, this uh, is our second segment of the show, so we're going to do three questions. Now, I am going to post this on our site, and you guys can join in the discussion, and we will be reading uh, your comments on our next show, which we actually have a anniversary show uh, coming up here real soon, which will be our two-year anniversary of doing this podcast. But enough of that. Let's get in our questions, shall we? Let's go. Okay, question number one is something, a topic I really wanted to discuss is WWE seems to be relying a lot on established stars and, like, people who were around in the past and keep bringing them back, such as bringing back, like, The Rock, stuff like that, to come in. And really the question is, should WWE stop relying on, like, established stars and that and start making new talent and stars like that? So kind of, I'll let you give your feedback and stuff on that. Well, if you really want the question answered, granted, I think it's a little bit twofold. And the reason I say twofold, meaning 50-50, is because, granted, I know it's, inter- I know it's in the entertainment stage where, you know, you have to put butts in seats and you have to draw money with some, not all, but some of the uh, established talent or veterans, as we like to call it. But also, based off the battleground situation where you really had young guys come in and you really had young guys really, really stepping up into the next level, I think it should be towards the young, the young movement. And for that reason, I think if WWE was really, really smart and just said, "Hey, here's the ball game, here's the ball field, here's the, you know, here's your match, go out there, steal the show," I think the young movement will really, really step up, and it will force every, and it should force everybody else on that roster to really, really step up and deliver a high quality match. I mean, that's my opinion. What do you yeah. think? Uh, I'm really of the opinion WWE does need to do a new uh, a youth movement, I, especially in the main event scene. And they keep going back to the well one too many times. You have Randy Orton's in the main event. John Cena's in the main event. They they have, like, Brock Lesnar in the main event. They have Triple H in the main event. They have all the the Rocks in the main event. They, they really aren't relying on their younger guys. And I really feel they do need to have another youth movement in WWE to give us some fresh faces. Especially in the main event scene. Well, that goes back. That goes back to a little bit of what WCW did, because WCW, uh, granted, they had, the majority of that locker room was young talent, but they relied too much on their veterans and on all the entertaining stars from the past. And I mean, it uh, it can help you and it can also hurt you because you don't want to, any locker room don't want to shortchange their young talent. But also, this is a message to the young talent. You got you got to step up too. I mean, granted, some of it may be office or whatnot, but you got to step up too and be get, and, and step up into really, really establishing yourself and not so much on the outside of the big of the big company's influence. But you got to step up and you got to believe in yourself to really say, "Hey, I am a main eventer." Yeah. And really, um, the, to piggyback off your point with WCW, if you go back and look at 93-94, Vince McMahon, it, and we'll talk specifically about Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, and he felt Hulk Hogan was really past his prime. He had reached his pinnacle or peak, and he really couldn't go anywhere. And he really wanted to, I guess, make fresh faces and new stars with Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, and really get them in the main event scene. So he kind of let Macho Man go. He let Hogan go, stuff like that. So it really revolutionized a youth movement. And initially, that kind of hurt him. If you go in the next few years, like 95, 96, it started giving WCW some momentum. And then by 96, when they turned Hogan Hill at Bash at the Beach, that really started a, a downside for WWE. But in the end, it ultimately worked in their favor because WCW relied, like you said, on the Hogan's and Macho Man's and already the established stars without making new talent, and that's really what ultimately WWF at the time, WWE, they won the war because of the making of the new stars, and I feel WWE currently is almost back in that WCW model to where they want to go back to the well one too many times instead of letting Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, 
all this young talent and break out and make new stars, I think they're just going back to the well one too many times. So I'll let you kind of piggyback no, I, off that. I, I think, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I mean, those are very, very good points. But the young talent's got to believe in themselves. Don't, and, and, and I'm picking back this up the word to task. You know, if you're in a company and, you know, you don't want to be successful, if you don't want to be one of the big top draws and you work for that company, then you need to leave. Okay. Because it's not for you. So you got to believe in yourself. You got to, you got to have, you got to want to be successful. Okay, so let's move on to question number two. Since you mentioned Taz, who was in TNA, we just saw last week where they uh, brought back the six-sided ring. Now, I'm going to make this kind of a two-part question. And was it good for the six-sided ring to return? And should TNA let the fans decide what ring that the superstars ultimately wrestle in? So I'll let you get it kicked off. Yes to both questions. Question For the first question. It's good for TNA to have that six sided ring back because you if if you literally went the majority of two thousand four all the way all the way through claiming that you're different. You can have a ton you can have a ton of new innovations and all of that, but you gotta have something that sets you apart from everybody else. Granted we're not in that competition era anymore as far as company versus company goes because there's a bigger competition out there. But for TNA, they needed to go back to what got them to Spike TV, what got them big ratings on Fox Sports Net during 2004 and 2005. They need to go back to those roots. And should the fans decide it, to be honest, they paid their hard-earned money, they paid their ticket. And granted, I know for a fact a lot of us, or some of us, aren't wrestlers and haven't been inside that ring. So I understand it from a wrestler perspective. But from a fan perspective, I'm like, you know, hey, some people even claim TNA to be the new WCW and have been for for years since WCW closed and TNA opened up. The only reason TNA set set themselves apart from everybody else is because they put the fans first and they let the fans use that First Amendment right. So, I'm going yes on both questions. Was it good for the six-sided ring to return? Yes. Was Is it good for the fans to decide? Yes. What do you think? Well, I'm going to say it was good for the six-sided ring to return. And I know you did mention the wrestlers and stuff. A lot of wrestlers were very vocal about it not returning, uh, especially Austin Aries and EC3 were noted in interviews and saying they didn't want it to return. And the reasoning was for, like, timing and stuff like that. It throws them off. But the reason it, I think it's good for the six-sided ring to return is, like, one, it sets them apart from WWE. It makes them have a different ring. Now, a lot or of people, anybody else for that yeah, matter. And it, it, a lot of people look at that as a novelty, but, I mean, it helps. And a business to where everybody is just cookie-cutter the same, you really have to stand out. And that's not only from a business perspective, of, but also a company perspective you uh, and a wrestler perspective. You have to set yourself apart. So I think it Got was you. good. Plus, it allows you to bring back your classic matches at TNA. A once held by King of the Mountain. Excellent Great point. match at, at Slammiversary. And it takes the boring off four-sided cage and it gives you new dimensions to play with. And TNA's cage matches were were so much better when they were six-sided. So all the great gimmick matches you had for the six-sided ring and just uh, make it better. And in terms of the fans getting to choose, I mean, and ultimately, I think you made my point. It's business. What was best for business as Triple H says, well, what's best for business is what the fans want. So if the fans want to see wrestling in a six-sided ring, then give it to them. And, and also and also to add on to that point, of course, every, a lot of people, if you really, really watch sports, you know, Ashley is now known as sports entertainment in multiple versions. If you really, really watch, sports is evolving. Wrestling needs to evolve. If that means doing something six-sided, because look at what MMA has done. Look at what a lot of people have done. It, it, you're, you have to evolve. You have to go with the times. That's what made WWE successful. I think that's what's going to make TNA successful, especially with everything they have now. Okay, well, we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to get to our last question right quick. And it's going to concern part-timers as world champion. With, the, with the speculation of uh, Brock Lesnar fighting uh, John Cena at SummerSlam, 
Um, this really brings up the point of part-timers world champion since John Cena kept the title at Battleground. Um, and a potential match between Brock Lesnar for the WWE World Heavyweight title and Brock not being a full-time wrestler er, and potentially winning the World Heavyweight, WWE World Heavyweight title. A lot of people, I think, are soured on that. So kind of what's your thoughts on that? Should they be world champion? If you're asking me from a wrestling perspective, no. If you're asking me from a business perspective, that will be a 50-50 depending on the drawing ability and depending on what's your intentions as far as, you know, Brock Lesnar being WWE World's Heavyweight Champion. I mean, is he doing, I mean, is he doing it for an entertainment perspective? Is he is he doing this for a health a health type of reason, or is he doing it to really really further Cena along, and really really be to Cena what Undertaker was to Brock Lesnar? Could this really really help? You know some of the part timers. To be honest, I feel if you're full time. Full-timers should have opportunities at the world title, not part-timers. I understand from business perspective, but I got to go. Full-timers should be world champ. Should have opportunity at the world title, not part-timers. Yeah, and I, I think I'm in agreement with you there too. Who is you have people who are there all year long and wrestle every uh, single time or are wrestling. On yeah, a full-time put the, basis. Yeah, put, the, put, the, put the hearts and souls into it. Go ahead. Yeah. Good, uh, good point. Yeah. So, I mean, they're really, I think, the ones who are more deserving. Now, I mean, if Brock Lesnar or other part-timers want to come back and give us a good marquee match at a SummerSlam or WrestleMania, that's fine by me. I'm not going to be upset, but they shouldn't be in the title picture because they should be able to defend the title on a, a monthly or at least weekly uh, a basis there. But that brings up this question. Should, if you are the champion, if you're the full-time champion, should you let new talent come in? Should you let your new talent, your full-time talent that you have, should you be willing to work with them and get them up to a par to where they can compete for the world title? Yeah, and I mean, that's a good question that we can uh, discuss at a later time. Um, but, I mean, you do make a good point there. And, I mean, I, I also, not only the potential Brock Lesnar, but, I mean, a lot of people soured a couple of years ago when The Rock won the title from CM Punk and was only bringing it back, was only, like, going to be on the shelf for, like, pay-per-views and stuff and, and wrestling. So, I mean, to me, it needs to be a defended at least every month, and that guy needs to be on the show every month competing or, or uh, some aspect. But the champion does need to be active, even though the title defense is at least once a month. He, the champ does need to be active. It needs to be an active champion, and that's kind of the argument for stripping Daniel Bryan of the title is because of being out injured, it would leave the championship dormant. And, but and that's the, the price dormant. you pay. But that's the price you pay when you sign up to compete in this sport. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for this segment. We're going to take another quick commercial break, and then we're going to go to our final segment. So uh, you can catch us after this short commercial break. Are you looking to grow your business? If you are, well, then you're in luck. We here at Jonesboro Wrestling are looking for sponsors for our weekly podcast, The Power of Pro Wrestling. If you are interested in sponsoring this, you can tweet me at Robert Red Jr. or you can contact me via email at jonesborowrestling at gmail.com. Once again, you can contact me at jonesborowrestling at gmail.com. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the, the official Power Pro Wrestling Podcast. Alongside Robert Red, I'm Chris Honigan. And yes, this is our brand new segment that we've kind of been adding on to this Power Pro Wrestling Podcast. It's Rapid Fire. The first time we did it, we talked about NXT guys being successful, possibly onto the main roster. This one, how about since the we talked about TNA a little bit earlier in this podcast, what about... In this rapid fire segment, I'm going to go through a list of names and the question will be, do you see them as the world's heavyweight champion in TNA a year or two years? Max two years from now. Okay. The Monster Abyss. Monster yes no? Abyss. 
Well, I mean, he's been with TNA for uh, quite a while, so I mean, if he does get the world title, I don't necessarily see it this year. I mean, I would say if he does get it, it would probably be in the next two years. I don't really see him in the running right now. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll be, it'll be, it, he will have to have tunnel vision, the old school tunnel vision that he had before when he won the NWA title for Sting in 06. Austin Aries, the big topic. Oh, well, with him being the X Division champion right now, and he's going to get to take uh, option C, I mean, I could see him in the next year being the TNA champion again. I, I see him. I see him. Possibility could happen this year. If not this year, probably late this year, early next year, 2015. Bobby Roode. Bobby Roode. Well, I mean, with him coming back, they seem to be pushing him. I mean, I definitely could see him uh and this year being world champion just as well as i did aries so i mean there's a, ca- a case that can be made for that as well so i mean it, this year if not this year next year definitely if it's tournament style i have to pick rude as the favorite because in tournament style almost like tajiri did back in the day in the 90s if it's tournament style it favors rude rude's got the rude's got the advantage oh <laughs> any member of the wolves Ooh, davy richards and eddie edwards Ooh, hoo. This is a good one. Now, they're kind of, they're the tag team champions right now. They really haven't done a whole lot of solo action. So, I mean, maybe not this year. I could say possibly two years. Years, if not that. I, I mean, I do see them as potential world champions eventually, but maybe not in the next two years. Here's a, here's, here's a good one for you. Kenny King. Ooh, that's a good wild card. Throw me a curveball there. Right now, Kenny King's not in the world title picture, so I mean... I, but he is in the main event role, though. He is in the main event role. I mean, good point there. So, I mean, he could potentially be world champion, but, I mean, it, he goes. it goes back to the Wolves. They're not really in the running right now, so I mean... And I would say probably in the next two years, if that, at, if he's lucky. And I, I, I would say any member of the Wolves, I'm not going to be surprised if Davey gets it first. But how about this one? <laughs> Ethan Carter the third. Ooh, EC three. Good old EC three. Because he in main event matches, he really has he's really has stand out. But what do you think on EC three? I mean, anything's a possibility in TNA. So I mean, he he could be the curveball and surprise us this year or maybe next year. So I mean, he could potentially uh, get to that spot, uh, uh, possibly in the next two years. I, I I really got him in the running. I say he I say if he at least be two more competitions, I would say. And how about this one? Samoa Joe. Ooh, Samoa Joe. Well, I mean, he's not quite a, in the running right now, but I mean, I can always see Samoa Joe by the end of the year getting that TNA title. And I, I, I got Joe in, I got Joe in this category. I would say if Aries is able to win that world title, Joe may be a possible challenger. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that does complete this Power Pro Wrestling podcast. We hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have. I'm Chris Honigan. And this is Robert Rev. We want to thank you for joining us. But before we leave, do you have anything else you want to say, uh, Mr. Heineken? And actually, and this is a little bit something that's cornbread approved. Promote love any and everywhere you go. Get rid of the rumors, gossip, hate, and drama. There's no if in faith. There's expectancy. Now that, my friends, is cornbread approved. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, cornbread approved message. And thank you guys for listening on the Power of Pro Wrestling podcast. And uh, join us next time. See ya.